There are things out there. Creatures, monsters, ghouls and spirits. Beings that fall outside the realm of visible truth, beyond the confines of our basic reality. They lurk in the dark, haunt the recesses of our minds, and stir our curiosity in the unusual and weird. They are taboo topics, stories that we tell around the campfire and folklore passed down from our ancestors. We've been taught that these things don't exist, that they are merely myth and legend. Or are they? Welcome to the Occult Archives. I'm your host and spooky librarian, E.M. Moon, but feel free to refer to me as E. Here lies a space beyond all spaces, a library full of arcane information enough to drive any normal person mad. If you can think of it, if you can question it, the archives probably have what you seek. Six six seven, Children of the Beast, Issue Number Four, Part One. Good versus evil. It is better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is yours. It cannot be taken from you, not by angels or by demons, heaven or hell. Buddha. June fifth, twenty sixteen, Salome Vex. It was just like any other night. I had gotten off of work early and was packing a small overnight bag. It may have been our birthdays, but we weren't doing anything different than we had the years before. We were going to take a little road trip upstate and spend the rest of the week in the countryside with lots of cows and fields of wildflowers. I knew that I needed the break, and I'm sure Kane did as well. Work had been stressful, and we both just wanted to get away for a bit. You haven't packed already? The door to our studio apartment popped open and Kane's hulking frame took up almost the whole doorway. I didn't have time, but I'm doing it now, aren't I? I threw up a sculpted brow in his direction. <sighs> Always last minute. Kane breezed past me and grabbed his already packed duffel bag and slugged it over his shoulder. You act like this is something different than we normally do every year on this day. I rolled my eyes as I stuffed two pairs of black shorts into my bag. <sighs> I know, but I want to get out of here soon. The weather is getting bad, Kane responded, changing out of his polished work shoes and into his steel-toed boots. I thought the forecast said there was a hundred percent chance of nothing, I responded. Kane seemed a bit weird as he anxiously waited for me by the front door. The weather changes at the drop of a hat, Salome. He was curt in his response. He never called me by my full name like that unless something was wrong. I'm ready, let's go. I wasn't going to argue with him. He held the door open for me as we locked up our tiny apartment and got our annual journey underway. Quit fiddling with the radio! Kane gently slapped at my hand as I cycled through the stations. There's nothing good on, and you know I don't want to just sit in silence. I grabbed the aux cord plugged into the front of the radio and attached it to my phone. A playlist sounds like a good idea. Kane agreed that the best way for us both to be happy with the music choice was for us to use one of our approved road trip playlists. I hit the shuffle button as the bass bumped through the speakers. So, what's the ETA? I settled into the front seat and cuddled up to my plush cat that Kane had given me as an early birthday present. We should get there sometime after midnight, just in time for the birthday celebrations to begin. Kane flexed his hands on the wheel. I had noticed that he was sweating. It was hot out, but not that hot. Are... are you okay, Dr. Frankenstein? You look like something is bothering you. I casually asked him. He was just staring straight down the road, gripping the wheel so hard I thought it would snap. I'm, I'm okay. Just really needed to get away. Kane responded, glancing at me from the corner of his eye. No, you're not. You're not okay. What wasn't he telling me? We told each other everything. Been best friends for years. I lounged back in my seat and just stared out the window. Darkened fields breezed past us as we drove north of Las Vegas. By the time we turned 30, we would be at the ranch. It was Kane's, technically, even though it wasn't exactly his yet. His grandfather had bequeathed it to him in his will, but he was still alive. He was ill, laying in a hospital bed as he waited out his final days. Kane made sure to see him as often as he could, and this last visit had given him the keys to the house. Permanently. This place is finally going to be yours. I tried to steer the conversation towards something more lighthearted, but that was a failure. No, it's not, Sal. It isn't going to be mine. Kane sped the car up as our headlights pierced through the night. 
I don't think I quite understand. It was already his, even though they wouldn't sign over the deed till his grandfather passed. <sighs> I lost it, Salome. It isn't mine anymore. Kane's voice was sullen as he finally turned his face towards me. <sighs> you didn't. I was stunned. All I could do was shake my head in disbelief. I did. I, I had to. They were going to take away the nightclub. I'm in so much debt, Sal. Kane looked like he was trying to keep it together as he revved the engine and drove even faster down the long, winding road. You gambled with your money too much, making too many investments in the wrong things. I wasn't trying to rain on his parade even more, but I had warned him. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sal. That makes me feel so much better. Kane almost broke the steering wheel with the grip he had on it. I just wanted to help you, Kane, but you won't let anyone help you. I turned to face my window in silence as I thought about what, what was just said to me. This would be our last year at the farmhouse. I let myself quietly slip into a catnap as Kane sped on into the night. I awoke when I felt the car decrease in speed. The steady 60 miles per hour that Kane had been going at was like a gentle lullaby, but now it had slowed to a crawl. <laughs> What's going on? I was groggy as I rolled away from the window and rubbed the sleep from my eyes. There's a heavy fog up ahead. Kane pointed his thick finger at the windshield. There was indeed a low-lying fog that seemed to be creeping at us down the road. Where could it possibly be coming from? It was an exceptionally dry night and there wasn't an open water source for miles. <sighs> what time is it? I squinted at the dash clock. It was just about midnight. Happy birthday to us, huh? Kane sounded forlorn when he spoke. He sped up despite the thickening fog. He knew the roads better than most. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kane. I unhooked my seatbelt and leaned over to kiss him on the cheek, right as we entered the fog bank. Kane thought he could just drive right through it, but it had proven to be a not-so-easy task. I seriously can't see a thing. Despite being blind in the fog, Kane kept driving rather fast. Maybe you should slow down, I suggested. We had begun to weave a little, but Kane insisted that he had the vehicle under control. I've got it, Sal. Don't want us crawling at a snail's pace all the way to the house. I want us to have as much time up there as we can. Kane was a little emotional. That much was clear. In our friendship, he was the one with the feelings. I was just cold and emotionless, or so I'd been told. Kane turned off his high beams and rolled the window down, sticking his head outside like a puppy, assuming it was easier to view the road that way. He took one gulp of the fog-filled air and began to cough violently, pulling his head back on the car. His eyes were watering as he slipped the glasses from his face and blindly tossed them at me. I opted for grabbing the wheel instead as the car jerked violently into the oncoming lane. Jesus, Kane, put your foot on the brake! I yelped as I directed the car back into its lane. He took a deep breath and I watched his foot lift hit the brake when his whole body went rigid in the driver's seat. Instead of the car stopping, the engine revved even higher. Kane's clunky booted foot had stomped down on the gas pedal when his body seized up. If I didn't get him to move it, we would both die. Kane! Kane! My voice screeched as I shook him. Then he started to scream. A sound like nothing I had ever heard before escaped his lips, ringing out inside the car. I wanted to cover my ears, but I had to keep my hands on the wheel as the car skyrocketed to almost 100 miles per hour. Kane's hands were tearing at his hair as he writhed in his seat, finally pulling his foot free from the gas pedal. The car began to wobble violently as it decelerated, and I strained to keep my grip on the wheel. Kane was still having one of the most terrifying seizures I had ever witnessed, and I struggled with the idea of quickly letting go of the wheel and pulling the emergency brake. The car was still going far faster than it should have as it came up over a hill and slid down the other side. We were picking up speed again, and Kane had finally stopped seizing, but the problem now was that he was out cold. The fog had seeped into the car and was now filling up the interior, blinding me from seeing which lane we were in. I had to pull the e-brake. It was our best bet with Kane's massive frame in the front seat. In slow motion, I turned the wheel to the left and wrenched up on the emergency brake. The car immediately began to fishtail as I felt every bone in my body go on lockdown. The trees were flashing as the headlights spun in circles with the car. I could finally move as the muscles in my body relaxed, but then the shredding pain started. First it was in my gut, then my chest, and then my arms and legs before it finally settled in my head. Screams began to echo as I raked my nails all over my body, hoping that the pain and the spinning would stop. I got my wish as the car came out on the other side of the fog, careened off the road, and struck a giant tree.
June 5th, 2016. Kane Wolf. I didn't mean to piss her off. She just wasn't helping the situation right now. I couldn't just tell her that I had made another bad financial decision, one that almost cost us our life. If it hadn't been for my quick thinking with letting them take possession of the ranch, Sal and I could have been six feet under in the Nevada desert. She was sleeping peacefully, or so it seemed. Maybe it was better that way for right now. It was almost midnight, almost the hour where Salome and I would cross over from our twenties and down the slippery slope of thirty-something. Thirty would be the last birthday we would ever spend together at the ranch. It had been a tradition since we were young. I tried to shake my head of the fog it was in, only to see it outwardly manifested on the road. A thick mist was rolling in our way, and no telling how far north it went. We were either going to have to park for a bit, or burst right through it on the other side. I knew the roads well enough anyway. I slowed the car down to assess the visibility. The sensation must have jarred Salome awake. What's going on? She asked groggily as she rolled away from the window and rubbed the sleep from her eyes. There's a heavy fog up ahead. I pointed my finger at the windshield. She watched it below closer, probably trying to figure out where the hell it was coming from. What time is it? Salome squinted at the dash clock. It was just about midnight. Happy birthday to us, huh? I tried to sound chipper, but my tone fell flat. The fog in my head had returned, and I couldn't help but let it get the best of me. I sped up despite the thickening cloud, trying to breeze right past my problems. Yeah, happy birthday, Kane. Salome unhooked her seatbelt and leaned over to kiss me on the cheek, right as we entered the fog bank. She had no idea what her touch even did to me. I thought I could just drive right through it, but it had proven to be not so easy task. Slowing down should have been an option, but I didn't want to spend any more time on this road. I wanted to be at the ranch with Salome. I seriously can't see a thing. Despite being blind in the fog, I kept driving at high speeds. No time to stop. Maybe you should slow down, Salome suggested. We had begun to weave out of the lane a bit, but I assured her I had the vehicle under control. I've got it, Sal. Don't want us crawling at a snail's pace all the way to the cabin. I want us to have as much time up there as we can. I was a little emotional, I'll admit. In our relationship, I was the one with the feelings, while Salome was a little out of touch with her sensitive side, despite people saying she was just cold. I turned off my high beams and rolled the window down. I figured if I stuck my head outside like a dog going for a good ride, I might be able to see better. But I took one gulp of the fog-filled air and began coughing violently, pulling my head back inside the car. My eyes were watering as I slipped my glasses off my face and blindly tossed them at Salome. I let go of the wheel in a blind panic as the car jerked violently into the oncoming lane. Jesus, Kane! Put your foot on the brake! Salome yelped as she held onto the wheel and tried to direct the car back into its proper lane. I took a deep breath and lifted my foot to punch the brake while my whole body went stiff. Instead of the car stopping, the engine revved even higher. My foot had stomped down on the gas pedal when I seized up, but I had no control over my body. If I couldn't get myself to move, we would both be in a world of hurt. Kane! Kane! I could hear Salome screaming as she shook me aggressively, but I couldn't respond. Then I felt every muscle in my body soften as it prepared itself for a blow that I hadn't anticipated. It felt like every fiber of my being was on fire as they vibrated inside my body. I began to scream in agony, not able to stop the destruction that was wreaking havoc inside me. I began blindly tearing at my hair as I writhed in my seat, finally pulling my foot free from the gas pedal. The car began to wobble violently as it decelerated, but it somehow stayed straight. Salome must have been holding the wheel. I was seizing aggressively with no control over my body, and I knew that Salome was probably freaking out, but I couldn't hear a thing. My ears were ringing something terrible. The car was still going far faster than it should have as it came up over the hill and slid down the other side. We were going to crash, that much I knew. There was no way that Salome could shove me from my seat in time to stop the car, and I knew she wouldn't. She'd have to open the door and push me out going almost 90 miles per hour, easily. I felt myself begin to slip away as the pain coursing through my body took me over the edge. She didn't have a chance, and I couldn't help her if I was unconscious. I woke up to the sound of the horn blaring. My face was smashed against the wheel. It was me making that awful noise. I pulled myself upright in my seat and shut my eyes hard before opening them again. My vision was hazy, as it always was when I was without my glasses, but it slowly began to clear and I could see much farther than I ever had before. I was absolutely amazed that I could perfectly see the detail and the bark of the tree we hit. 
We had wrecked the car. We. Salome. My body twisted in the seat as I attempted to check on her, but I hadn't been expecting what I saw. Salome hadn't had her seatbelt on. She had taken it off when she went to kiss me at midnight. Her body had gone through the windshield and was crumpled up against the trunk of the tree. Glass was shattered everywhere, and I could see blood dripping from the broken visor. I, I screamed. No, howled when I saw her lifeless form slumped on the hood, her head facing away from me. I struggled to pull myself free and go to her, but the seatbelt had locked tight up against my chest and was digging into my sternum as I tried to break free. Maybe she was alive. Maybe she was... Don't kid yourself, Kane. She couldn't have survived that. I fumbled around for my boot knife and cut myself free from the belt before trying to push out of the car. The metal of the door had crunched up like an accordion on impact. There was no way it was opening now. Fuck! I cursed with every ounce of air in my lungs. I threw my shoulder into the door and surprisingly the whole thing came off and crashed to the ground. I barreled out of the opening and onto the hood of the car, careful not to move Salome in case she was still... Salome? Sal, baby. I reached out to touch her face. It was cold. I didn't want to look at her. I knew they would only haunt me for the rest of my lonely life without her. This wasn't supposed to fucking happen. The circumstances surrounding the house may have been shitty, but I wasn't going to let it stop me from having a great weekend and finally telling Salome how I really felt about her. We had been friends since grade school. We grew up together. I was supposed to protect her. I'm a rather large, scary man when I have to be. But in that moment, I just cried. Long and loud. I howled into the night out of despair. And then something howled back. June 6th, 2016. Adam Bodine. What is going on in here? Josiah burst through the dining room door with everyone else in tow. They must have heard the diviner shatter. Uh, we were... We were... Henri stuttered, scratching the back of his head as he fumbled for a really good explanation. We were using the diviner and I broke it, Violet replied, saving Henri the trouble. <laughs> you used it without our supervision? Josiah spoke directly to Henri and ignored Violet altogether. It's his invention! Violet roared. She was not taking Josiah's ill-directed anger very well. Y yes Invention. That is all it is. That glorified paperweight basically told us nothing. Josiah turned his rage onto Violet. I wanted to sock him in the face. Sock him so hard that his nose audibly snapped. It hasn't? Assumptions like that make an arse out of people. You haven't asked me what I saw yet. Violet's feet almost hovered over the ground as she floated closer to Josiah. She was about five seconds away from going totally crazy on him. Josiah looked sheepish, but tried to hold his arrogant air as he spoke. Then what did you see? A lot. More than I ever expected. I think that I may have found a common denominator between Adam and myself, as well as who my attacker was. Violet settled in front of Josiah. We all waited for her reply on bated breath. Henri and I knew about the... angel, but she hadn't mentioned anything else. That man? Leather trousers? <laughs> he was an angel of death. She spoke and waited for the information to sink in. Excuse me, did you say an angel of death like the one that took the firstborn in Egypt? Medusa threw her eyebrow up and questioned. I guess so. I saw it. I watched him transform from a beautiful man with feathered wings to a cloaked skeleton. I could just feel it in my bones. Violet closed all three of her eyes as she clenched the fist that was still stained with blood. We were right then, angels and demons. Leo scrutinized Violet before turning his attention on me. Let's not jump to conclusions, Leonard. Don't go assuming that these kids are demons. Jackie defended us outright. I don't know what we are, but I think that we were created by someone. Apparently, I'm a test tube baby. Violet's words were bitter as they seeped from her teeth. She had been an IVF baby after all. How had she not known? But Adam isn't. Henri pointed at me. Well, the cat was out of the bag now. I would have to tell him what I knew. I... actually am too. I started off slow, facing the small group of people that was now listening intently. I've been doing some digging into my past and found out that my mother was part of a fertility research group that resulted in her pregnancy with me. They were originally just supposed to be harvesting eggs, but 
A second round of paperwork that she didn't read thoroughly before signing allowed them to essentially impregnate her. Part of the contract was her relinquishing custody of me to the fertility clinic. I was uncomfortable relaying this information to such a large group. How... how is that even legal? Cassandra looked disgusted at the thought of someone taking another woman's baby. Because she signed the paperwork, she gave up her rights to the clinic and they legally took custody of me before sending me into foster care. I don't know all the details. I shrugged. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. Then what about you, Violet? Josiah turned back to the three-eyed wonder in front of me. I... Mother had always told me that my father had left before I was born. Clearly, that was not the case. From what I saw, she was a willing participant for the implantation. Violet turned her one seeing eye towards me as she spoke. Hmm. Huh. What are the odds, though? You were born in Belfast, Adam in New Orleans. There was an ocean between you. Henri didn't want to accept that there was an association. I had no idea why. Maybe it was the same medical organization, I suggested. That was a pretty good possibility. The same organization? Mm, possibly. What was the name of the clinic? Josiah wanted to finally finish this mystery. I don't know. The clinic is closed now. All the information I got was secondhand and through locals. I found her death certificate before anything. That made two moms dead for me. Josiah didn't even have to ask Violet. My mother worked for a medical facility, the name of which she was not permitted to tell anyone. I have a feeling that the medical facility and the fertility clinic are one and the same. Violet seemed very sure of herself. All right, then. Let's just get some rest for the night, shall we? We plan on going to the cemetery tomorrow. Josiah clasped his hands as he prepared to exit. The one where we... I started to ask, but he didn't let me finish. Transformed, yes. We're hoping to figure out what that fog actually was. Rooms are ready for you upstairs, Violet on the left of the hall and the two of you on the right. Josiah pointed at the brothers before exiting the dining room without another word. Violet didn't budge as everyone filed out of the room. She still had her hand clutched at her side, completely motionless. Let's get some sleep, Vi. I placed my hand on the small of her back and she jerked away from me. That sounds like a good idea. She mumbled, following me and Henri to the second floor. Do you need anything? I asked Violet as we stood in front of her bedroom for the night. Henri had gone to his own room. He didn't have any strength left in him after the 24 hours we had. Just sleep. Violet brushed a lock of virgin white hair out of her third eye. If you need me, I'll be in the other room. I pointed at the door across the hall. Thanks, Adam. I'll be okay. Violet shuffled her feet closer to the door. She was subtly telling me she wanted to be alone. Okay. Good night, Violet. I had this sudden urge to hug her, but I knew she would not be so fond of that. So I settled with just a nod and a hasty retreat to my bedroom. Maybe Violet needed the space right now. I know that I needed to do some thinking myself. June 6th, 2016. Violet Eve. I know that he was just trying to be nice, but I didn't want any reassurance right now. I was already going over what tomorrow was going to be like. I wasn't sure if I was ready to go back to Ground Zero, but I knew that I needed to. They would be different in the daylight, too. Would I be able to handle the sight of everything? I just pushed the thoughts to the back of my mind and piled my frosted hair atop my head before securing it with a bone comb I found on my dresser. The mirror on the vanity held a reflection that I wasn't entirely used to. The dusty lilac of my flesh, the visage of eyes blinded by my own body, the third one that stared back at me with violet intensity. I was literally staring at a character from one of my own books. Not one that was published, however. The reflection was almost identical to a character I had been working on for a story that hadn't even been written yet. It was just a face I had seen, a body that showed up in a dream one night. Dreams. It seemed that they had been telling me something all along. Then a thought struck me. The dream I had had on the plane. I let myself fall deep into the memory as I crawled atop the four-poster bed and clicked off the bedside lamp. Had it been a dream? Maybe I just slept through the whole flight like the man had said. Or maybe it had been something else entirely. Maybe it had really happened and that businessman was trying to make me go down with the ship. As I drifted off to sleep, my mind had made its way to my first night in New Orleans, the night I was attacked on my way back to Missy's. Was that man wrapped up in this too? 
I never got to answer my own questions because sleep overtook me, and I drifted off into another one of those questionable dreams. I had no idea who these people were. Two faces that were unrecognizable to me. Just one man, a very large man, and one woman, driving on a dark road that I had also never seen before. They looked like they were arguing, and then the woman fell asleep. For some reason, I couldn't hear anything. It all played out in front of me like a silent film. It felt like hours before the woman finally woke up from her nap. He gestured at the clock, and she unhooked her seatbelt before giving him a kiss on the cheek. But then my vision narrowed on the road. A thick fog was rolling at them through the high beams. The man pointed this out to her, and they stared on for a bit before he rolled down the window and stuck his head out. Everything after this point seemed to speed up. He began coughing, stomping on the gas as he flung his glasses over into her seat. She reached out and grabbed the wheel to steady the vehicle when he went rigid, his foot now permanently mashed on the gas. The woman was clearly freaking out as my dream changed positions, and I was looking in from the front of the car. The fog was speeding past us as the woman deliberated with herself on whether or not to pull the e-brake as they came up and over a hill. The man was now seizing violently in the front seat, ripping at the hair on his head before he finally passed out. She made her choice and yanked up on the emergency brake, but no sooner had she flexed her arm when the same affliction as the man came over her. The car careened off the road and struck a tree, flinging my perspective out behind the vehicle and ejecting the woman into the tree on impact. Screeching metal and shattering glass broke the silence of the movie and almost jolted me awake. A honk sounded into the night. Someone was laying on the horn. If there hadn't been any noise, I would have thought I had paused everything, but the horn ceased its incessant blaring and I could see the man's shadow in horror as he discovered his companion dead on the hood of the car. The driver's door blasted from its hinges and the hulking man lumbered out, his sobs ringing out through the deserted field behind the wreck. He came over to the hood and climbed on top. I couldn't see what he was doing, just that his howls had gotten louder, and something returned those howling sobs. Wolves. Or it sounded like wolves. As if those animalistic cries were a cue, a dark SUV pulled up behind my line of sight, its headlights blinding me from seeing the wreckage. Dogs were barking, wolves were howling, men I couldn't see piled out of the other vehicle and began surrounding the accident. Put your hands up and come with us. Step away from the woman and put your hands up. Someone was yelling at the man that now seemed like he had nothing to live for. Dark figures, four-legged figures, began appearing from the field. I couldn't gauge perspective in my dream, but something was telling me that these were far too large to be wolves. Call an ambulance, the man called out, holding his giant forearm up to shield his eyes from the blinding light. He hadn't heard a word they said. Come on now, Kane. She's clearly dead. A different voice responded, and a man came into my view. Merrick. I could hear a rumbling coming from the hood of the wreck like someone had kindled the engine. Hands up now, Kane. You're coming with us. There were some issues with the deed you signed over to me. That house isn't even yours yet. We were going to just kidnap your girl, but you fucked all that up. Now we will just have to take you instead. Merrick pointed a large caliber handgun at Kane. Everything shifted. Kane vaulted over the back of the car as a shot rang out, and the shadows that had been prowling the perimeter howled before leaping in to fight. Men were screaming, bullets were bouncing everywhere, yelps and furious growls snarled in the background. The headlights blew as something was slung into the front of the SUV. The battle ceased immediately as everyone was left blinded by the total darkness of the desert. I wasn't sure I could handle anymore. I was ready to wake up, but the glowing green figure now hovering above the hood of the car drew my attention back in. Salome? I heard Kane whisper as the figure floated out over the war zone, but her light was extinguished shortly after. Another shot rang out and Salome fell to the ground. Kane cried out again and went to protect her when another fire from the gun took him down too. Men were now scrambling about and I could barely make out Merrick scooping up the woman named Salome and dumping her in the back of their vehicle. They somehow got the headlights working again, started the engine, and sped off down the dirt highway. Kane was left alone, bleeding in the desert sand not able to help the woman he so desperately tried to protect. I woke up in the middle of a field of browning grass. It was dark and nothing but the waxing moon shone over my head. What the fuck? I cursed, sitting up as I looked wildly about me in the darkness. I was in a field, the desert from my dream. Strings of curse words and slang phrases began spewing from my mouth as I stomped over to a tree I now recognized. There was still broken glass and shards of plastic that littered the dirt, but the car wasn't there anymore. 
The plush cat that I saw the woman clutching had been left behind, however. I picked it up and held it close as I walked towards the curb of a road. Where was I? What fucking state was I in? I was still in nothing but that white dress and no shoes. In the middle of nowhere USA, I suspected. I needed a telephone booth, but those didn't exist here in the States anymore. Except for the one that was right next to me. It was a red box, of course, because that was the only thing I knew. There was now a phone to call for help, but I still hadn't the foggiest idea of where I was. The light had started to come up on the horizon, so wherever I was, it would be morning just about everywhere. I stepped into the booth and picked up the receiver, and then stood there like a dummy because I didn't know anyone's phone number. But that third eye had a better memory than I did, and my finger flew to the buttons as I punched in someone's number. After three rings, a man answered, O'Neils, it's way too early. How can I help you? Nate? I hissed into the receiver, not quite sure why I was whispering. Violet? Nate seemed surprised to hear my voice on the other end. Uh, I need Adam's phone number. I bit at my lower lip, hoping that he wouldn't ask me why. I thought you were with Adam. Nate wasn't going to let me go that easily. I, uh, uh, I, I am. I was. Nate, just... Please give me his phone number. It's incredibly important. I was going to need a pen and paper, but I noticed a pad and ink pen dangling from the phone. Um, yeah. It's, a uh, 555-555-0002. Uh, everything all right? Nate reluctantly gave in, but was rather concerned about my well-being. I'm fine. Talk to you later. And I hung up the phone before he could say anything else. I waited impatiently for a second to make sure the call had ended before picking the phone up again, trying not to fumble as I punched in the new number. It rang and rang, but no one answered on the other end. I hung up and tried again. And again. Finally, on the fourth call, someone picked up. I swear to God, if you don't stop calling my phone, I'm going to strangle the living- Adam? I interrupted him before he finished threatening to kill me. Who is this? Adam still sounded rather angry. I must have woken him up. It's, uh, Violet. I breathed before going on to say more, but it was Adam's turn to interrupt. Why are you calling me? Couldn't you knock on the door? I could hear Adam shuffling about as he got dressed. Uh, I would if I was there. I just wanted to explain to him what was going on. W wait, you're not here? <sighs> Josiah's not going to like that. I could practically hear Adam shaking his head. I don't give a damn what Josiah is going to like. Just listen to me. I was getting frustrated. I just woke up in a field somewhere. I have no idea where I am, and I need you to come get me. You... W wait. Rewind. You woke up in a field? Were you sleepwalking or something? Adam's breath was broken as he paced around. N no. I was focused on the road now. A car was coming over the hill. Hold that thought. I dropped the phone and ran out of the booth, waving my arms at a little yellow sedan. The car slowed when it got to me, and a woman in her early fifties gasped. Sweetheart, I don't know where you've been, but you look like you've had a rough night. You need a ride? She smiled at me, despite the purple everything. She had to be on some sort of psychedelic to not be afraid of me. Uh, no ma'am, I, I was just wondering where I was. I, uh, I'm new around here. I tried to keep my third eye from wandering about. You're in Eureka. The woman continued to smile at me. And that would be in which state? <laughs> I didn't know the geography of the U.S. all that well. Nevada, sweetheart. The woman winked at me before I waved her off and shot back into the phone booth to finish my call. Adam? I picked the receiver back up and held it to my ear. Where the hell did you go? He sounded aggravated now. I had to ask somebody where I was. Adam, I'm... I'm in Nevada. I waited for the inevitable what the fuck to follow. What the... Violet, you're on the other side of the country. What in the ever-loving fuck are you doing all the way out there? I, I don't know, but I think I may have brought myself here somehow. I had a really weird dream last night, and whatever I saw must have taken me to Nevada. That was the best way I could explain it. Then bring yourself home. Adam now sounded worried. I, I don't know how. I have no idea how to fix this. How am I going to get back to you? The words just slipped out of my mouth. I meant to say home, but that wasn't right. I should have said New Orleans, but Adam was the only thing I sort of cared about right now. We'll figure it out. Whose phone are you calling me from? 
I could tell that Adam was now bounding down the stairs. It's a payphone that I made, I think. I squished myself up inside the booth and pushed my foot against the door. Okay, stay where you are. I'll call you back in ten minutes. Okay, hurry, I urged as the line clicked. It wasn't like I was going anywhere anytime soon. June 7th, 2016. Cane Wolf. They had Salome. Merrick had Salome and she was alive. Or, or maybe we all imagined what happened. All I know is that when I came to after my second unconscious episode, all bodies were gone. When I got to the cabin, I let myself in and just collapsed on the master bed as I started to cry again. I had never cried so much in my life. I fell into a very shallow sleep for the rest of the day. Our birthday before getting up well after dark. There was still plenty of canned food in the cellar, and I was able to eat a little something before dragging myself to the bathroom for a shower. It was then that I saw what I really looked like after the worst night of my entire life. I broke the mirror. One punch shattered the whole thing. Saying that I scared myself would have been an understatement. I thought I was just delirious until I realized it was my own reflection. My eyes were the first thing I noticed. They were usually a deep brown, almost black, but now they were red. The whole eyeball was blood red. The teeth in my mouth were insanely large. I don't know how I didn't feel them before now. Everything else seemed normal, save for the talons I had for fingers. This all had to be a bad dream. There was no way that any of this could have been real. I washed my face a few times, hoping that it would correct what I saw, but there was still a monster looking back at me in the mirror. What in the fuck had happened to me? To Salome, for that matter. She had floated over me as a glowing green specter. Oh, after she came back from the dead. Now my monstrous good looks weren't the most incredible thing that had happened, but Merrick had her, just like he had wanted in the first place. I had hoped that he wouldn't have questioned the authenticity of the paperwork I had given him for the ranch. I had photocopied the original deed, whited out some pertinent parts, repenned it, and copied the whole thing again. Apparently, Merrick had taken the time to look into it, thus knowing that I had lied to him about ownership of the property. So he took Salome from me. I hoped that if she was as half as scary as I was, that she would put him in the dirt and get away, but she had been shot also. I was lucky with the placement of my wound, though she may not have been. A cigarette sounded really good right about then, but I didn't have any. I left everything back at the wreck save for my wallet in my back pocket and the keys I had managed to pull from the ignition. I was miles away from any convenience store, and walking wasn't an option. Now was not the time to go without one of the two things that could help me get it together. But I did have my wallet, and I did have the car keys. The keys to my now wrecked Kia, and the keys to my grandfather's old work truck. The sun was just coming over the horizon as I flipped the tarp off the rusty blue truck and climbed into the driver's seat. I was worried that the engine wouldn't turn, but a miracle made it happen. I could be at a convenience store in half an hour, get myself some smokes, a drink, and chain smoke half the pack before buying a whole carton. The ride was going to be longer than I liked, but it would at least afford me the time to stop and look at the wreckage. Maybe it would give me some answers. I saw the hill only a few yards away. That meant I was close. I slowed the truck down and prepared myself to pull over when I almost nailed a British phone booth that was propped up behind some unruly shrubbery. The brake screeched as I put my foot to the floor and yanked the wheel back, stopping just in front of the door to the booth. Someone screamed. There was someone inside the phone booth. I backed my truck up and attempted to keep it close to the curb before throwing it into park and hopping out to see who I had possibly hurt. The door to the phone booth opened and a woman stepped out. A purple woman, dressed in a nightgown and holding the cat I had given Salome. Blind rage suddenly filled my field of vision with red. I had this distinct feeling that whoever this bitch was, she was working for Merrick, and came back to see what had been left behind and if they could salvage it, just like he always did when he robbed anyone. I didn't give her any time to speak before I lunged with a snarl straight at her tiny throat. June 7th, 2016. Adam Bodine. We have a big problem. I burst into the kitchen where Cassandra and Jackie were making lunch. I knew it would be better if I talked to her over Josiah. Good afternoon, sunshine. We thought you and Violet were going to sleep all day. Cassandra smiled, handing me a plate with a sandwich and some chips. Um, Violet's not here. I just got right to it. Say what now? Jackie cocked an eyebrow at me and leaned against the counter. 
something happened. She just called me from a payphone in Nevada. I didn't have a lot of time to explain. I had to call her back in ten minutes. Cassandra dropped the plate of sandwiches that she had been holding and just turned to Jackie for some sort of response. How the fuck did she get to Nevada? Did she hop a plane out of here in the middle of the night? Jackie laughed at me. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine, but she said Nevada, and I think I heard someone in the background mention Eureka. I assured Jackie that this was no joke. That's like a six-hour flight. Where in Eureka is she? Jackie was finally taking me seriously. I don't even know. I told her I'd call her back in ten with some sort of idea on how to get her back here. I was getting antsy. I needed to make that phone call. I'll call and arrange tickets for Las Vegas. Take Henri with you and don't mention this to anyone else. Jackie narrowed his eyes at me while Cassandra stood by silently. I'll talk to Henri while you go call the girl back. Cassandra and I will run defense for you. Jackie slid a sleek cell phone from his pocket and scrolled through his contacts for a number where he could book a flight. Be careful, Adam. Keep us updated along the way and make sure you get Violet back safely. Things out there won't be forgiving with the way you two look. Cassandra warned me. She was right, too. I look like a dragon on two legs with a beard. I'll put on my uh, secret disguise and no one will be any the wiser. I winked and let myself out of the kitchen. I flew up the stairs to my bedroom and hit redial on the number Violet had called me from. Hello? Her voice sounded muffled on the other end. You okay? I had to check on her before I told her the plan. Just dandy. Thirsty, hungry, wanting a smoke. I've closed myself in the booth, but I am quickly regretting that as it is blasted hot in this state. I just let Violet unload. You are out west, in the desert, but at least you're safe. Jackie is buying two plane tickets to fly us out to you. I let her know that we were coming to get her immediately. How are you going to find me, though? I don't even know where in Eureka I am. I could hear Violet tapping her nails on the metal frame of the booth. You need to go... I paused as I scrolled through a map of Nevada on my phone. South. Just keep going south and find someone who can point you in the right direction. I'd tell you to be careful, but I think you can handle yourself. I directed her. It's not whether or not I can handle myself, but if people can handle me. Violet didn't seem like she approved of this plan. <laughs> it's either this, or you figure out a way to teleport your ass back here. She had to know it was either one or the other. Fine, I'll just... Is that a car? Violet's voice was muffled as she pulled the phone away from her mouth. <laughs> her last word was almost inaudible. The phone was dropped just before a loud screeching sound cut through the call. Violet screamed and I could hear the phone slap in the walls of the booth as it swung around like a lasso. Adam! Adam, are you still there? Violet sounded pained when she finally picked the phone up. Oh, somebody almost ran their truck into the phone booth. Are you okay? I was thoroughly panicked at this point. She was so far away and there was nothing I could do for her. She had just been rammed by a truck too. Hopefully the other person was kind enough to help her. I'm fine. A little banged up, but okay. He's back in the truck up now. Let me call you back. Violet sounded a little shaky. Hopefully we will be out here sooner than later. It's a six-hour flight. Please be safe. I wanted to say more, but I knew she needed to talk to whoever it was that almost ran her over. Of course. Bye, Adam. Violet hung up the phone. I had given Jackie enough time to talk to Henri. I was ready to go. I had been packing my bag the whole conversation with Violet, and all I needed now was a ticket in my hand. We couldn't get to Violet soon enough. Violet Eve. I came out of the booth even though the door gave me hell and stepped outside still holding the stuffed cat. The man that had practically hit me with his truck was already outside of it, but he wasn't trying to see if I was okay. His face was bright red, as red as his eyes as he stared me down. The shoulders on his broad frame were heaving up and down as he growled like some disgruntled animal. I was looking at the man I had seen in my dreams last night, the one who had tried to save his girlfriend, except he didn't look like he was happy to see me. In a blur of movement, the man was on me. My hands flew into the air and I lost my grip on the stuffed animal as I went crashing to the ground. Kane was gnashing at my throat with wolf-like teeth as I shoved at his face to get him off of me. I was yelling at him to stop, screaming that I wasn't a threat as he blindly tore at my skin with his claws. He slung me across the ground when he couldn't tear my throat out, and I scrambled to get up before he came at me again. He was incredibly quick for a man his size. I hadn't noticed that he was even taller than Adam until just now. Kane came barreling at me like a freight train. I didn't want to have to hurt him. I tried to step out of the way, but he tackled me to the ground like a rugby player and went back to trying to bite me. 
I was going to have to defend myself. Evasion was doing nothing for me. I kicked him back from me before cracking him one good time in the temple with the side of my fist. The blow made him yowl, but he went right back to trying to tear me apart. Cain was just going in for the killing blow when I finally screamed, Cain, stop! And he did. His eyes widened from their glare. The lips that were peeled back over his teeth settled, and his claws slacked at his side. Despite this, he was still breathing heavily, ready to pounce. Give her back to me, he rumbled, flexing the razor-like claws of each hand. I don't have her, Cain. I don't even know who you and Salome are. I had no idea how I was going to explain any of this to him so that he believed me. Then how do you know our names? He roared, ready to charge at me like a bull again. Because I dreamed about her. I I dreamed about you both. I can't explain it. Something brought me here for a reason. I begged for him to understand. Prove it to me then. Prove that you're not one of... One of Merrick's associates? I'm not. I'm not even from around here. My name is Violet, and I had a dream about you and Salome driving to the cabin you go to every year on your birthday, which was yesterday, same as mine. And you gave her this. I picked up the stuffed cat and held it close again. I don't even know how I know any of this. I slowly walked towards Kane, the stuffed animal outstretched in front of me. Kane eyed me cautiously. It was an early birthday present. He seemed almost embarrassed as he spoke. And you can give it back to her. I swallowed hard as I pressed the stuffed cat into his chest. Kane hung his head low and just shook it slowly. I don't see how. Have you seen yourself? You don't think you could take a couple of thugs with a busted SUV? I arched a white brow. You really did dream about all of this, didn't you? Kane finally released a breath that sounded like he had been holding it in since he nearly ran me over. Hand to God, I swore. Why are you purple? Kane switched gears on the conversation. Why do you look like a dog? I suddenly felt defensive, but I knew why he looked the way he did. I have no idea, he snuffled. Do you? It was the fog. The same one that you drove through found me at a party in New Orleans. This is the result. I ushered down at myself, blinking my third eye. What did it do to us? Kane was now bawling at the stuffed animal in his fists out of sheer apprehension turned us into mutants? I shrugged. But seriously, we don't really know. We? There's more of you? Caden hadn't apparently thought that far ahead. Five that we know of. You, me, Salome, and my friends Adam and Missy. They all have the same birthday, too. I was starting to get tired as I explained myself to Kane. June 6th. How old are you? He leaned in closer to me, those red eyes almost as difficult to behold as my third. Thirty, as I suspect both you and Salome are as well. I was starting to get dizzy, and Kane could tell. Do you need a ride? Kane reached out and helped steady me. South, if you'll take me. Kane led me to the truck and popped the passenger side door for me. South is where I'm headed. He smiled as we both hopped into the truck and sped down the road. Is this as far as you're going? I questioned Kane as we pulled into a gas station. Do you need to go further? He arched an eyebrow at me in query. I technically need to get as close to Vegas as I can. I stayed put in the truck as he unbuckled himself and climbed out. That's almost a five hour drive. (laughs) Kane scoffed at me. Of course it is, I huffed. Almost 12 hours till Adam would be here to get me if I couldn't hitch a ride to Sin City. What do you want to go to Las Vegas for? Kane paused in the doorway. My friend Adam, I mentioned. He's coming to get me. I explained, hiding my face as a man pulled up in a work truck and parked his car by the pump. You can't leave now. You, you have to help me find Salome. Kane ducked when another car pulled in. Kane, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I just shook my head. You saw us in your dream. You're connected to us somehow. Kane climbed back in the truck and shut the door. But, but I can't control that connection. I don't know how to consciously do any of this. I needed him to understand that I wasn't some divining rod that pointed people in the right direction. You said there were more of us. Adam is one of us. What about your friend Missy? The question from Kane made me cringe. What about Missy? 
Missy won't be of any help. Adam, maybe. I'll make a deal with you. Go get whatever it is that you need and take me as far down to Las Vegas as you can. The closer to them we are, the quicker we can find Salome. I struck up a deal. Done. Let me go in and grab some smoke so we can go. Kane seemed eager to leave. I didn't blame him. Do you have a phone I could use? I asked as he got out of the car. Kane tossed a mobile at me before jogging into the convenience store. Hopefully no one lost their mind over the way he looked. I assumed Adam would probably be on the plane, so I wasn't prepared when he answered the phone. Hello? My answer was more of a question. Violet, where are you? Adam seemed almost breathless when he spoke. I'm with a man named Kane, another one of us. I waited to see if Adam would freak out. A another mutant? Is that why you ended up there? He was quick. I didn't have to explain anything. Yes, he's going to take me down to Las Vegas. I paused in my sentence. My deal involved Adam without his prior consent. Perfect. We've already booked a flight back to New Orleans for the three of us. Adam sounded relieved. I knew that would be short-lived. But... I drew the word out. But what? Mm, but I promised him that we would help him find Salome first. I flinched in preparation for an argument. And that would be who? I could hear someone in the background on Adam's end calling for boarding. His question was almost drowned out. Salome is Kane's girlfriend or something. She's... Don't tell me. Another one of us. We don't have time to hang out in Vegas, Violet. Our flight is for tomorrow morning. Adam had voted no on my promise. Then you have to confine me in Eureka. Pick an option. I was a little sassier with my response than I meant to be. We're already going to be in deep shit for being gone this long. Cassandra and Jackie are trying to hide this little recon mission from Josiah until we can prove to him that you didn't run off. Adam was a lot calmer than I expected. Yeah, I just hopped a plane with no money in the middle of the night to jet out to Vegas in a country I don't know a whole lot about. But anyway, what if I can assure you that we will find her before our flight out of here tomorrow? Will you help me then? I was being terrible trying to get him to agree with me without letting him know that a very dangerous, very armed group of men were holding her hostage. Violet. Please. I came here for a reason, Adam. I stooped to an even lower level. Manipulation. You better have her pinned before we touch down around five o'clock. We grab her and we go. There's no time to fool around. Adam was serious and I thanked him. I'll call you when I get down that way. I think I'm just going to have Kane take me to the airport. I could see Kane coming out of the door rather quickly. All right, just sit tight. I'll see you in a few hours. Adam hung up just as Kane was jumping in the truck with an armful of cigarette packs. We should go. I tried to calm the dude down, but he just freaked when he saw my face and started throwing cigarettes at me. Kane emptied his armful at my feet, threw the car in reverse, and peeled out of the parking lot. <laughs> Mind if I have a pack? I picked one up off the floorboard. Be my guest. Where to now? Kane sped down the vacant roads toward Sin City. I knew a little about Vegas, thanks to the telly. To the airport in Vegas. Adam will meet us there, and then we can go rescue Salome. I was playing a game here. I didn't tell Adam about the gangsters, and I hadn't told Kane that I had to have Salome's location figured out before their flight landed. I had a lot betting on this, but I knew that I needed to help them. They were probably bastard children, just like Adam and me. Kane sped on down the road as I settled into my seat and focused on Salome. I had a lot of work to do in a few short hours. Kane Wolf. You okay over there? I asked Violet in between puffs of my cigarette. I'm trying to focus, she replied. I could see the reflection of her face in the window, the eye in the middle of her forehead panning about. Are you trying to find Salome? I flicked my cigarette out the window and lit another. Yes, but I'm failing. Violet sighed audibly and closed all three of her eyes. I was going to try and say something encouraging when my phone rang. Who could have been calling me right now? Hello? The number was restricted, but I answered it anyway. You survived! This couldn't have gone any better. Merrick's slimy voice laughed in my ear. Is she alive? I had to know that first before I started making any negotiations. She is, surprisingly, and quite the scrapper. Merrick's voice had a sickening quality to it. What are the terms? 
I dove right in, glancing over at Violet. All eyes were still closed, but I swore I saw the third one squinting in my direction. I want the ranch and everything that comes with it. <laughs> Matter of fact, I want everything that your grandfather owns. I could hear the sheer malice in his voice as he spoke. How am I supposed to do that? I feigned ignorance. Merrick must have found out that my grandfather owned a lot more than just the ranch. I don't know, Kane. You're the smart one. Merrick hissed. Violet turned her head to me, her brow knit. She was focusing on the phone. Keep him talking, she whispered as her eyes closed again. I'm glad you at least recognize that. Before I go making any deals, I want to talk to Salome. I insisted, eyeing Violet as she tried to hone in on Merrick's location. As you wish, I heard Merrick pass the phone off, and then a grunt before her voice came over the line. Kane? Sal's question was weak. What's going on? They keep drugging me. She was high. I could hear it in her voice. I don't know, Sal. I'm going to come get you. Just hold tight. I fought back tears as I struggled to hold it together for her. I heard them say that I... That I... Salome couldn't finish her sentence because the phone had been snatched from her. Kane, I'm giving you enough time to get to Las Vegas and go visit that poor, ailing grandfather of yours so we can officially close the deal this time. I'll call you after you leave the hospital. Merrick's words weren't quite making sense. How are you going to know when I leave the hospital? I saw Violet's eyes pop open and she smiled. <laughs> she knew where they were. How did I know where you were the other night? That's my little secret, Dr. Frankenstein. Don't try to come find her either. I'll know that you aren't where you're supposed to be, and you'll be picking up pieces of your pretty little girlfriend all over Las Vegas. Do I make myself clear? Merrick wasn't fooling around. I frowned at Violet before responding. Yes, to the hospital, and then I wait for your instructions once I leave. I agreed. But I had no idea how I was going to pull any of this off. Remember, Kane, play by my rules, and no one has to die. Again, Merrick hung up the phone and I lobbed my own behind me. We, 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 we can't just go to her. Merrick must have my phone bugged or something. He knows exactly where we are. I hammered my fist into the steering wheel and the car jerked into the other lane before I was able to pull it back. Well, there went the truck's alignment. Maybe I can get myself to her somehow, like I got here. Violet looked just as restless as I was. You can always try, but then who is going to meet your friends at the airport? I couldn't have her getting into even more trouble on my account. Just keep heading where he told you to for now, and I will figure something out. Violet curled up in her seat and went back to her meditation. I was just going to head towards the hospital and hope that Violet could get us out of this ordeal before I had to go meet up with Merrick. We're here. I parked in the visitor's lot for the hospital and shook Violet awake. Where is here? Violet rubbed at her eyes. It made me think of Salome's nap the other night. The hospital where my grandfather is staying. Merrick wants me to basically take everything from my granddad and give it to him, even though that isn't up to me. I got out of the car and waited for Violet to follow. I don't have any shoes. Violet's toes were dangling out the open door. I think your bare feet are the least of your worries. I replied, pointing to my forehead. Because you look much better. You're more terrifying than I am. Violet was instantly defensive. She was right. I was terrifying. I may not have stood out like Violet did with all the purple and white, but I definitely looked like some sort of monster. Sunglasses and I'll just keep my mouth shut. I pulled a pair of old aviators down from the visor. Good disguise. Violet's lips were pursed. Take this. I tossed my grandfather's old worn flannel jacket at Violet. She slid it on, but it practically swallowed her whole. <sighs> I look like bloody E.T. Violet pulled the deep hood over her head. But at least you're not an actual alien? My words of encouragement were lacking. <laughs> That's something, then. I need to call Adam and let him know that I made it here much quicker than I thought. Violet held her hand out gingerly for my cell. I drive like a bat out of hell. I handed her my phone and she dialed the number. Violet followed me as I took back entrances in the stairwell to get up to my grandfather's room. It was between mid-time, so I hoped that he would be alone. There was a slight fear in the pit of my stomach that just the sight of me might kill him. I knocked on the hospital room door while Violet hung out in an alcove with the phone. <coughs> Come in! 
I heard my grandfather cough, wheezing as he tried to catch his breath. Hey, Granddad. I slowly entered the room. Thank God the blinds were closed. Kane, What are you doing here, boy? You're supposed to be at the cabin. My grandfather tried to sit up in his hospital bed, but he was having a hard time. I was, but I wanted to come see you. I pulled a chair out and sat next to the bed. Where... <coughs> where's Salome? Did she like her present? He smiled at me, the tubes in his nose moving slightly with the wrinkles on his face. She's out shopping. I hated lying to him. But she loved the cat. I forced a weak smile, but kept my mouth closed. What's wrong, boy? I can feel the negativity rolling off of you. My grandfather narrowed his brown eyes right at me. I, I wanted to tell him, but I didn't think he could handle it. Granddad was a shamanic practitioner, but a practitioner who hadn't done much spirit work in years. He gave it all up when my grandmother died. I can't give you details, Granddad. I just... I need... I couldn't get the words out. I couldn't tell him that I needed him to give me everything he had, that I needed to basically rob him of all his worldly possessions for my own selfish reasons. Kane, you're in money trouble again. But my granddad knew. My mother had had the same problem. It was genetic, apparently. It's bigger than that. We were losing the nightclub, and I had to take money out to pay for all this stuff so I could get it back up to code, but it's taking longer than I anticipated, and all the money I make goes into keeping the apartment... I didn't get the loan paid back in time. I just word vomited all over my sick and dying grandfather. What were the consequences? I could tell my grandfather was disappointed, but he wanted to help, just like he always did. I tried. I tried to sign the deed for the ranch over to Merrick, but he found out that it wasn't exactly mine yet. He came after me and he... He... I could feel the tears coming. Now was not the time. He took Salome. My grandfather finished my sentence and laid his IV punctured hand on my knee. It's far more complicated than that. The details weren't important right now, though. He kidnapped her and is now holding her hostage until I give him what he wants. My grandfather waited quietly for the details. I could hear the steady beeping of his heart monitor and the hissing sound of his oxygen tank. Merrick wants everything, Granddad. He wants everything you own before he will give Salome back. I hid my face out of shame. Kane, my grandfather took a deep, ragged breath. The only thing left is the ranch, and all that is tied to it. I donated the rest of my assets already. Merrick wouldn't just settle for the ranch. He had to have it all. He wanted all his old money, too. He wanted every dime that my grandfather had racked up while living in Vegas during the 60s. I don't think Merrick is going to be okay with that. Just the ranch... He was very explicit. Not thinking, I took my sunglasses off and wiped at my eyes. Oh, my poor boy. My grandfather's eyes widened as he saw the red of my own. What did Merrick do to you? I hurriedly put my sunglasses back on and straightened myself up. Yeah, he shot me, amongst other things. Something happened on our way to the cabin. There, there was this fog that rolled in and it caused me to wreck the car. I killed Salome, and somehow she's still alive. Merrick found us after the wreck and kidnapped her, but not before shooting me. I couldn't hold it in any longer. Besides Violet, my grandfather was the first one I had confessed anything to. Are you on something? My grandfather immediately looked angry as he scowled at me. No, nothing. Only thing in my system is cigarettes and energy drinks. I don't expect you to believe me, but I figured you'd at least give me some credit. My feelings were hurt like a scolded puppy. None of that makes any sense, boy. Prove it to me. Prove to me that this isn't some story to cover up more trouble. My grandfather waited for me to give him at least one good reason why he should believe me. I took my glasses off again and rolled up my sleeves before going over to the window to open the blinds. What happened to you, my boy? My grandfather's face softened as he took in my bloodied eyes and fanged mouth. Just what I said. The fog changed us, me and Salome both, and there are more who were affected, thousands of miles away from here. As if that were a cue, Violet entered the room. Sorry to interrupt, but I was getting some really weird looks out in the hall. Violet tried to keep her voice low as she stepped into the room and clicked the door shut. My grandfather leaned out of his bed to see Violet better as she came and covered her tiny self behind me. 
You're telling me the truth. <coughs> You're telling me the <coughs> damn truth. My grandfather coughed out of surprise. I have to find a way to save Salome. When I leave here, Merrick is going to call me and direct me to where she is. He has my phone tapped. I could feel Violet trying to hide her face from my grandfather's gaze. I, I don't know what to do for you except... <sighs> There's a safe at the farmhouse. It's buried under the floorboards in the kitchen and is full of old bonds and expensive things that I won. Take him that. My grandfather's brow was furrowed as he spoke. I, I don't want to. It's yours. I can't take it with me, Kane. My grandfather cut me off mid-sentence. Thank you, but I don't know how I can get to it in time. Merrick is expecting immediate payment when I leave here. I didn't have time to drive back to Eureka and down to Vegas again. Merrick wouldn't give me another chance. Then don't. I just got off the phone with Adam. Their flight landed about 20 minutes ago, and I told him to meet us here. I'll go back to the house and find the money. Violet interjected, trying to steady my nerves. How are you going to get back there? I threw my hands up. It was nice of her to offer, but she was worse off than I was in some ways. Don't worry about it. Your granddad can show me. She pointed at a photo sitting on the bedside table. It had the farmhouse in the background with me and granddad standing on the front porch. Are you going to just... I waved my hands in front of my face, poorly pantomiming someone disappearing. I still don't know how to control what I do, but it has a tendency to just do it for me in times of need. I'll make it there somehow. Can I? Violet asked as she reached out a purple hand to take the photograph. My grandfather insisted, and she held it, studying it. Adam's going to come here looking for me. I gave him the room number and everything. If there is a phone at the house, I can call before heading back. Violet closed her eyes, but the third one stayed open. How are you going to carry everything in that safe? My grandfather was writing a number down on a piece of paper before he folded it up and passed it off to Violet. If I have to shift the whole safe, I will. She nodded, stuffing the piece of paper into a front pocket on her dress. Do you need anything else? I was beside myself with anticipation at this point. If Violet can make it to the house, find and retrieve the contents of the safe, and then make it back here, it would be a miracle. Just ask Adam if he can get me something else to wear besides this damn dress. I really want to wear some trousers. Violet winked at me before backing herself into the corner and slumping down on the floor. I don't understand what she's trying to do. My grandfather leaned in and whispered to me. She has special powers or something. She somehow dreamed about me and Salome and then woke up in the field we crashed in. I tried to explain it the best way I knew how. Then if she has special powers, you must also. You need to figure out what they are and hold on to them. Life is going to be different for you from now on. He croaked, beating his chest with his fist as he started to cough again. I had heard him, but a part of me had zoned out. There had been no movement, no sound of the door opening and closing, but Violet was gone. Adam Bodine Turn in here! I pointed at the emergency entrance of the Sunrise Hospital and Henri pulled in, parking just on the other side of the emergency entrance. I hopped out before he even had a chance to throw the car into park and raced inside to the front desk. Excuse me, can you tell me where room 324 is? I asked the older nurse sitting behind the counter. Take the elevator to the third floor and go to the left. She peered at me over large spectacles. I was wearing my sunglasses with my hood up, so I'm sure I look like a safe person to be roaming around the hospital. <laughs> there you are, Adam. Can't go wandering around like that. <laughs> Henri came in behind me and took me by the arm. He just had his eyes dilated and he can't see very well. <laughs> Henri steered me past the sign for the elevators and pushed me inside once we found them. You're going to draw too much attention to yourself if you don't calm down. Henri scolded me as we took the elevator to the third floor. I just want to see Violet and make sure that she's okay. I huffed tapping my foot impatiently to the Muzak version of Stairway to Heaven. You've gotten really attached to her. Henri spoke to me without making eye contact. I saved her life the first night she was here. I hadn't told Henri about any of that. What do you mean, saved her life? You said that you just saved her from getting hustled on Bourbon Street, not her life. 
He now eyed me with a sidelong glance. It's technically how I met her. She was down by Canal Street when I was walking home that night. Some man was trying to... You know, either way, I stopped him. I, I killed him. I hadn't mentioned that part to another living soul either. Adam, you didn't. Henri's nostrils flared as he spoke. I, I didn't mean to, but when we went back the next morning, the body was gone. There was no police tape, no sign of any police presence. I'm starting to think that whoever he was, he wasn't human. It felt right to finally say it. I have no idea what it was that I killed, but it had to be done to save Violet. Two people already have come for this woman, Adam. We definitely need to keep our eye on her. Henri put his hand on my shoulder as the elevator dinged and the doors opened up on the third floor. We stepped out and asked for directions to room 324, but found the door closed. I knocked and waited for someone to answer. The door cracked open and a blood-red eye peered out at me. Adam? A very western voice questioned me. Kane? I questioned back. It had to be him. The door opened enough to allow me and Henri to squeeze through, and Kane shut the door behind me. I felt like it was safe to take my sunglasses off and let my hood down, all the while Kane watching me. He took his own hood down and we just stared at each other for a moment. He wasn't as obvious as I was. His eyeballs were pure red, no pupil whatsoever, and the teeth that were tucked under his lips looked like they belonged to a wolf. The fingers of his hands were wildly sharp as he curled them into fists to hide them. Our heights were almost a match, but King was easily twice my size with long, tidy locks that hung just past his shoulders. I wondered what his special mutant abilities were. I I'm Kane. He held his hand out for me to shake, but I pulled my own from my pockets. They were cloaked in Cassandra's fancy oven mitts and wrapped with layers of tinfoil underneath. <laughs> you don't want to shake these. I slipped a mitt off and tore away the aluminum foil. The metal smoked as I peeled it back and balled up the remnants. Holy... Wow. Wow. Kane just breathed as he stared in awe at my molten hands. Yeah, it takes some getting used to. I clasped my hands together to keep them from setting anything on fire. The, the fog did this to you? Kane gestured at me as he sat down next to his grandfather who was peacefully sleeping. Yeah. I nodded as Henri hung back to watch the conversation. I could tell by the look on his face that he was completely fascinated with Kane. Changed me and my best friend Salome. Kane's voice was shaky when he spoke her name. Salome. It reminded me of Violet. Where was she? Where is Violet? I finally asked, wondering if maybe she was in the bathroom. She went back to my grandfather's farmhouse to get what Merrick wants. She also asked me to have you get her something else to wear since she's tired of the dress. Kane was looking forlornly at his grandfather as he absentmindedly answered my question. I'll get to that in a minute. Why don't you explain to me what happened? I could tell he really needed to take his mind off of things. I let Kane give me the rundown on how he had borrowed money from these loan sharks, couldn't pay it back in time, and gave over the rights to his grandfather's ranch, but they hadn't been his to give away. Merrick took Salome as collateral and wanted even more than that before her safe return. And how did Salome change? I was curious about what she was like. Uh, I'm not even sure. I, I killed her in the wreck, and then she came back from the dead. There was this whole fight when Merrick showed up and... and... Kane paused thoughtfully. And, and then the wolves came. Wolves? What? No one had mentioned any wolves to me before now. They were howling right after we had the wreck, and when Merrick showed up, a ton of them came down through the pasture and just attacked him and the rest of his goons. Kane looked like he didn't even believe his own words. They fought with you? I was a little skeptical myself. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I think they did. And then in the middle of it, Salme just floated out over the car like the Green Fairy before someone shot her out of the sky. I, I don't understand any of this. Kane held his head in his hands. I wished I could do that. The things you take for granted. From what we can gather, it has something to do with our birthdays and how we were conceived. I gave Kane what little information I had. I get the birthday part, but not the part about how I was conceived. It was Kane's turn to be skeptical. Both Violet and I, we don't know who our fathers are. We were both conceived through in vitro fertilization using donor sperm, I suspect. I'm starting to think we were genetically engineered. It all just really clicked for me. 
I mean, I, I never knew my father either, but my mother never mentioned anything about in vitro. Kane thought my explanation was questionable. <sighs> That's because she didn't like to talk about it. Kane's grandfather was awake and having a hard time trying to sit himself up. His grandson helped him and waited impatiently to hear what he had to say. Your mother had been married before you, <clears throat> before you came, and had tried her damnedest to get pregnant. The man she was with was convinced that it had something to do with her and made her go see a specialist. They urged them both to get tested and it came back that her husband was the culprit. Low motility. He just couldn't accept this and left your mother, blaming her for everything. She wanted to desperately have a child and she was getting up there in age, so she decided to look into in vitro with donor sperm. She ended up getting pregnant with you. His grandfather patted Kane's hand. This is unreal, Kane sighed, leaning back in his chair. My name is Walter, by the way. Kane's grandfather tried to shake my hand, but I showed him what I was working with. He just nodded knowingly. I'm Adam, and this is my brother Henri. I pointed over at Henri, who was standing nervously by the door. This makes me feel like I'm on the X-Files or something. Kane whistled, flexing and relaxing his claws. <laughs> Violet keeps calling us mutants. I chuckled. I hope she was okay wherever she was. <laughs> X-Men. Even better. Kane laughed with me. I decided to keep the atmosphere light and ask a few personal questions to loosen him up. So is Salome your girlfriend? I asked, scooting a chair up next to him. <laughs> I wish. I I've been trying to get up the nerve to ask her, but stuff always gets in the way. I was going to do it when we got to the ranch, though. I was going to ask her to be mine. <laughs> Kane knit his brow, those blood-red eyes flashing with something I couldn't quite place. We've known each other since grade school. She would spend time with me out on the ranch, help me with schoolwork, have dinner with my family. We were inseparable. I think I've been in love with her since the day we met, but... Salome just has this bad habit of dating guys that will never be good enough for her. I watched every minute of every painful relationship she has gone through, and it just killed me. She's been single for months now, and I just knew I had to finally do something. I could tell he was really hurting over her. We'll get her back. Violet will get whatever you need, and then we'll find her. I assured him. I know. Kane responded, but I don't think he really believed what I said. There's something I need to tell you, Kane. I heard Walter whisper as he leaned into his grandson. Before he could get another word out, someone knocked and the door cracked open. Kane and I hastily threw our sunglasses on and flipped our hoods up as a nurse wearing all white scrubs entered the room. Kane and I got up as the tall woman brushed past us and straight over to Walter. How are you doing this evening, Walter? My name's Heaven and I'm going to be your night nurse. She reached back and fluffed his pillow. I'm gonna slip out for a smoke, is that okay? Kane whispered to me as the nurse chit-chatted with his grandfather. Go for it. I think I may send Henri to get Violet some clothes and go with you. I whispered back, casually strolling to the door. I'm going to give you your meds, Walter, and then the doctor wants to draw some more blood to check your platelets. The nurse spoke sweetly to Walter as she handed him a paper cup full of pills and a small bottle of juice. I'll be back in a minute, Granddad. Kane called out, immediately turning his back to the nurse. Go smoke, boy. I'll be fine. I'm seeing heaven right now. The old man chuckled as I leaned into Henri. Can you go down to the gift shop and see if you can find something for Violet to wear that involves pants? I'm going to go have a smoke with Kane. I asked my brother. Henri just rolled his eyes as he opened the door and the three of us filed out. I hoped a cigarette would take the edge off while I waited for Violet to get back. Hopefully she wouldn't just teleport herself into the hospital room unannounced. Violet Eve. I just remembered clutching that photo tight, watching Kane talk to his grandfather when I was suddenly somewhere else. It was an old farmhouse, more like a cabin, with the trees swaying in the breeze of the front yard. The sun was starting to turn orange, but I still had plenty of light to see. Before I even tried to enter the house, I headed off to an old shed around back. I rifled around for some sort of tool I could use to pry up the floorboards, before finally finding a crowbar and a rusty axe. I hadn't even thought about the front door being locked when I went to reach for the doorknob, but it twisted effortlessly, and the door creaked open. The light was on in the living room, bedroom, and bathroom, but the kitchen was still dark. I panned around for something that might stick out to me when I could see the discoloration in the floorboards. 
there were at least eight planks that were lighter than the rest. I quickly got down on my hands and knees and jammed the crowbar between the cracks in the floorboards. They groaned in protest as I tried to rock them back, but they just wouldn't budge. I knew I was stronger than this, but the floor had swelled up from the heat, and they just weren't going anywhere. Come on! Come on! I practically pulled the crowbar all the way back to the floor, but the wood still wouldn't budge. Fuck! I just need to get under the floor, damn it! I pulled back on the crowbar one last time, but it flipped back over my head and nailed the front of the sink, chipping the porcelain. There were no oddly colored floorboards now, just a space in the floor where they had once been. I could see the safe, an old one, nestled snugly amidst cobwebs and a lot of dust. I really wished I knew how I was doing all of this. I wasn't sure I could lift it from the hole, so I wished for it to move itself from the space beneath the floorboards. The hole was now vacant, and the meter-tall safe was sitting next to me in the kitchen. Now to get into it. I pulled the slip of paper from my pocket and dialed the knob to the correct combination of numbers. The metal door clicked as I heard it unlock and the door swung open to reveal a metal safety deposit box, a large manila envelope, and at least 20 stacks of high denomination bills. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. I whistled, standing up to find something to put everything in. I quickly spotted an old rucksack hung up in the hallway and began stuffing it with the contents of the safe. When everything was safely nestled inside, I wished the safe back in its hole and the floor patched up. Now all I had to do was get myself back to the hospital, but that wasn't so easy. I felt a twinge in the back of my head, urging me to walk over to the mantel in the living room. It was lined with all sorts of frames filled with family members and friends alike. There was one picture that stood out though, and it was of Cain and Salome. Kane had explained to me on the ride to the hospital that he and Salome were nothing but friends, but I could tell he felt differently about her. He was in love with her. They looked so happy in the picture, too. Salome was wearing an all-black dress with a black rose in her hair, and Kane had on a purple button-up shirt to match my third eye and a tie with little machetes on it. I picked up the photo and opened the back of the frame to see if there was a date. 6 6 14. This must have been taken on one of their birthday trips. This photo got me thinking about Salome, alone and scared, being held hostage by some ruthless thugs. She didn't understand her transformation. I heard her say so on the phone to Cain. She just wanted to come home. The room started to shake as I set the photo back down and watched as the cabin crumbled around me, the wood plank walls peeling back as the shingles on the roof caved in and the room transformed itself into a different location. I was now standing inside a nightclub. It wasn't open yet, but I could hear talking coming from the back room. I wasn't supposed to be here, so I had to make myself scarce as I quickly padded over to where the conversation was coming from. You think you will actually come through with anything? A thickly accented voice spoke. He will if he thinks he's going to get Salome back. I need to have it all. The money and the star-crossed lovers. It's important that I make this exchange and everything else will just be a bonus. Merrick was the one who responded. I was wherever they were holding Salome hostage. I listened in closely to see if I could gain any more intel. How many more are around here? The other voice asked another question. Just the two of them that I know of. I've been watching Kane for years. Merrick responded. How many more of what? How many more like us? Do you want me to feed the girl? Chatty Cathy over there just had all sorts of questions, but this one was important. No need. Her hunger will just fuel her anger. I think I've convinced her in her delirious state that he won't come to rescue her. He doesn't have the money, and she knows how he's gambled with his money before. I'll have her wrapped around my little finger by the time he gets here. Merrick chuckled maliciously. These men were more than just criminals. They were something else entirely. I'm going to go relieve Lorne then. The other voice notified his boss and started to head for the open doorway I was standing near. I slunk back into the shadows and waited for him to pass before wheeling myself back to the hospital. I had to let the men know that Merrick had other plans for us. Do you guys prefer longer or shorter stories from the Archives episodes? Let me know on Facebook. You can find me there at facebook.com slash the Occult Archives. I'm also on Instagram at the Occult Archives Podcast and on my website author-emmoon.weebly.com. You can also become a member of the Archives on Buy Me a Coffee for as little as $3 a month, or you can just tip me and buy me a book for as low as a buck. 
The more you interact with me on social media, the more likely it is for me to be seen, and that helps bring you more spooky content. But that's all for tonight's Stories from the Archives episode. Until next time, lock your doors, salt your windows, and remember, it's okay to sleep with the lights on. <laughs>